three million square miles of ocean, spotted with over 2,000 green islands. This is Micronesia. One of the larger spots, in fact the second largest in Micronesia, is Panape Island. Together with its outer atolls and the island of Kusai, it forms one of the six districts in Micronesia. And even though 99% of our country is the Pacific Ocean, it is the land that is most important to us, as land must be to every other people. In Truk District, on some of the islands which have a high population density, a man will say, that is my food, as he points to his parcel of land. In the Marshalls, we have a land tenure system that survived the administration of three foreign powers over the last century. The system provides for all members of Marshallese society, each of whom obtains land rights at birth. Land means agriculture, and agriculture means food. Agriculture makes up our major export, providing our chief source of income, and over 80% of this comes from the coconut, that is from the sale of cobra. Agriculture is literally our only livelihood. Up until very recently, we have continued the traditional practices that have been going on for centuries in planting yams and taro. Here in Panape, a man's prestige can depend on his ability to grow yams. We have over a hundred recognized and named varieties grown on the island. The culture of perennial yams is the true, intricate technique which is not generally known by the average producer. Such cultivation secrets as choice of soil, size of planting hole, are passed on from father to son only by demonstration. The main harvest time is from November to January, near the beginning of the dry season and right in the middle of Christmas, the traditional feast period in Panabe and the Marianas. Large yam tubers are carefully dug out, tried to hibiscus poles, lifted from the planting holes and carried to the village site. Breadfruit may be regarded as a symbol of romance by foreigners, but throughout Micronesia it remains as a major staple food source as this Palawan wood carving indicates. We have over 70 varieties growing on truck and ponape, where steam baking in stone ovens is a favorite method of preparing breadfruit. Among our most important subsistence crops, if not the most important, is taro. There are many varieties among the dry land and wet land types all of which provide little of one's daily nutritional requirement, but are filling, especially when accompanied with fish or some canned meat. In some islands, as in Kusai, the tubers are peeled, boiled, then mashed and covered with coconut milk and served as a pudding dessert called fava. Taro is especially important to the people of the outer islands. It is the only local source of starch. The taro patches on the coral atolls must be made by hand, pits that are dug out six to eight feet deep, depending on the elevation of the water lens. These taro pits require heavy composting, leaves, palm fronds, coconut husks, everything decomposable is made use of. The wetland varieties require fresh, cool water during the 9 to 12 months needed for development from planting to maturity. Taro is propagated by separating and replanting suckers which develop at the base of older plants. Sirtisperma, or giant swamp taro, is considered to be the taro of Micronesia. 
Its social and economic importance differs from district to district, even island to island. It is regarded as reserve food on Panabe, but serves as an everyday stable in truck and is the king of taros in Yap proper. For centuries, we had only the fish from the lagoons and indigenous crops like taro, yams, breadfruit, and bananas as our food sources. During the last two decades, we have seen a definite change to rice as the main staple throughout Micronesia. The indigenous crops are not disease free. Taro has the leaf hopper, fungus, and comb rot to contend with. On Panabe, the African snail is a major pest in the taro patch as well as in the garden. The snail population is extensive, even though gids collect them daily to boil them for peak. With their high pin value, they serve as good complement to the lean and starchy leftovers, which are the normal diet of the animals. Even though the agriculture department has a program to upbreed the native stock, progress is slow. Most pigs go unpent, foraging for themselves in the jungle. And the jungle is everywhere. We began building the bridges, but we have few roads yet. What is it like in our world? The earth is forever green because the sky is forever wet. Our annual rainfall is 200 inches. Plants grow fast, including the weeds. There is a kind of jungle grass we call repatil that will dominate over all other vegetation unless it is kept in check by regular bushing. This means cutting down all the grass and weeds with a machete once every 30 to 60 days. As a rule, Bonobans are proud that they can manage their farming alone, but when it comes to bushing, teaming up with the neighbors makes a lot of sense. These men work together three times a week, each time on a different member's land. Today, they are bushing around recently planted coconut seedlings. It is a dual purpose operation. First, the young seedlings are freed from the choking effect of the weeds, and secondly, the chopped up weeds act as a mulch, protecting the soil from the burning rays of the sun, and in time, decompose and return to the soil. In order to speed up the general agricultural development of Micronesia, the Dry Territory government requested Peace Corps to help with the job. Since 1967, we have been working in the field, concentrating on coconut rehabilitation and on establishing school gardens along with 4-H type clubs. The volunteers were trained by the Agriculture Division following a learn-by-doing philosophy. They tried their hands at most of the jobs, sometimes for no other reason but to better appreciate the skill and effort involved in doing them. Everything from mulching a garden in a cool afternoon rain to gathering coconuts, which weigh about one pound each, unhusked, and cutting out the mead, which is the cobra, once it is dried. Today, Cobra is the lifeline of the Micronesian economy, making up for over 80% of all our exports. The first people to really recognize the value of Cobra and to encourage Cobra production in a methodic manner were the Germans. Many of the tall, pencil-like palms of today are from the German plantings around 1900. 
This means that they are anywhere from 60 to 70 years old, which is about the maximum producing life of the coconut. And this is one of the major reasons for an overall replanting program, so that new, young coconut trees can again take over the bearing that the old trees are unable to do today. An average coconut palm will produce anywhere from 6 to 10 ripe, full-sized nuts each month. Here we see the husking process, which remains unchanged from hundreds of years ago. The metal cover which slips onto the wooden spike is a Japanese refinement. It takes a lot of hard work to make one bag of cobra, which weighs about 100 pounds between 130 and 200 nuts must be gathered, husked, cut out, tried and then delivered to the cobra warehouse. The coconut palm probably has the most uses of any other palm in the tropics. Here, during the drying process, we use the empty coconut shells for fuel. Its trunk produces timber, its unripe nuts food and drink, its inflorescence fermented and unfermented drink, alcohol, vinegar, thatching material, strips of fiber for making ropes, baskets, mats, hats, brushes, brooms, caulking material, oil for food and cooking, illumination, making soap and lard, an ointment, and an oil cake for feeding domestic animals and fertilizer. With drying complete, the last remaining operation is the backing and delivery to the main Cobra warehouse on Panape. Since we have no roads in the outer municipalities, a family must make a canoe or boat trip in the lagoon transporting the 10 to 20 bags of Cobra which they may have cut over a period of one month. In most areas, they must wait for good weather as well as high tides before they can make the trip safely. For the people of the neighboring atolls where the bulk of the cobra is cut, delivery means waiting for the field trip vessel, MV Casalelia, which may call every two to eight weeks, bringing food, mail, medicine, and to take cobra on board. At Kapingamarangi, the southernmost atoll in Micronesia, a Polynesian island lying only two degrees north of the equator, the lagoon is deep and the MV Casalelia can anchor safely just a few hundred feet ashore, thus simplifying the loading. Along with the cargo, there are always plenty of deck passengers who are traveling between the atolls and the district center. As we return to Colonia Harbor in Ponape, the Gunners Nut, one of the four major logistic vessels of the Trust Territory, is waiting to take Cobra on board.
here, the next stop is the refinery. And for us, it is back to making more cobra for the next trip. The role of the district agriculture station is to provide information and technical support to farmers and to coordinate all agricultural activities through its extension service. Without trained extension agents to follow up projects, no program can succeed. It is in this area of training and extension where we continue to experience difficulties. We have a number of possibilities to improve our economy through new crops such as citrus. But the problem of selection remains to choose the variety best suited for our climate. At the agriculture station as well as elsewhere, cacao plantings are plagued with a fungus which requires the cutting out and burning of infected trees to hold the disease in check. It is from the agriculture station nursery that farmers receive their citrus, cacao and vegetable seedlings. Also, the nursery recently provided thousands of eucalyptus seedlings to begin a forestry program under the supervision of a Peace Corps volunteer forestry specialist. The Marianas district is the central breeding station for bull tree, swine and cattle. But the quantity and quality of livestock is a continuous problem throughout Micronesia. Poultry projects such as this community effort in Moluk, Panape are very new. In most areas, chickens are left to roam and breed at will. Outside the district center, swine breeding is done indiscriminately using any boar available. Needed are expanded foundation stock, extensive feed trials, and the dissemination of information. Under the Director of Agriculture, the Trust Territory Staff Entomologist in Palau District is concentrating his efforts toward control and elimination of the most serious threat to Micronesia's cobra-based economy, the coconut rhinosaurus beetle. Here on Bonabe, a staff plant pathologist supervises plant disease control programs and conducts experiments in an attempt to improve existing plant varieties. Grafting fertile tomato seedlings onto strong eggplant rootstock in order to withstand the heavy rainfall is one such promising project. The Bingla breadfruit disease is another plant pathology project under continuous investigation. As a result of the disease, breadfruit branches die away beginning at the ground until the entire tree is lifeless. The most important of the new crops has been a staple of the million of people for centuries throughout Southeast Asia. Over the last 20 years, it has become our staple food in Micronesia. Yearly, about 13 and a half million pounds of rice is imported by Micronesians. This import could be cut in half if all land that is capable of producing rice approximately 2,000 acres just on Ponape alone is utilized as such. The greatest problem in rice growing today is the its initial cost involved in starting a rice field. In most instances, it has to be cut out of the jungle-like area, an area which has not been touched for 20 or 30 years. It takes a great deal of effort in every sense of the word to create a rice paddy out of a jungle. Since most Micronesians are still at the subsistence level, we cannot expect a man to hack away for days and weeks and provide for his family at the same time. Yet the work goes on. The supervisor of the rice project, who is a Philippine graduate of the internationally recognized Rice Research Institute, comments the cost of uh, development varies from 200 to 300 dollars. This depends on the type of vegetation that is present in the field initially. 
It will cost about 30 to 40 dollars to plant one acre. It will cost about the same for harvesting. Now, for fertilizer, our uh, standard recommendation calls for about 45 dollars per acre. That will give you a total expense of 125 dollars initially. This is uh, reasonable enough to give you a profit of about 125 dollars on the first crop. Later on, as the planting progresses, you will get more because your initial cost for clearing the acre is already taken out. Water is plentiful, but the fields will remain necessarily small until we build an irrigation system. This requires heavy equipment along with trained operators and capital expenditures which we do not have. We have about four different locations where really big scale operations are possible. One of the obstacles we are meeting in using this heavy equipment is that there are no train operators to handle this. Most of the tractor operators, as far as migrations are concerned, are trained on dry lands. Operating an heavy equipment on soap, soggy, or flooded fields is an entirely different thing. In the beginning, most of the rice planted was the high-yielding IR8 variety, popularly known as the Miracle Rice. It was developed at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. However, instead of being a blessing, it presented an unusual and unexpected problem. Its taste was not appealing to Micronesians who were used to the longer-grained American and Australian varieties. Today, we have two new varieties, the IR1160 and the IR253, all of which are less highly yielding than the IR8, but taste-wise, they are well liked. Immediate goal is to cut off the importation of rice into the district. This we are trying to do. The development of the road system in Bonape will surely help in this project. This will facilitate our transporting of materials, the inspection or the visit of the extension agents, and the bringing in of equipment for development. I would say that the accessibility of the areas through, uh, by the roads should have helped in this development by at least 50%, so we should have doubled our acre rates. time rice farmers, we don't have those yet. Uh, we are trying to make some. We figure that they can make money and live decently and adequately if they have about three or four acres per family. I can say that ponape pepper is the best. It's superior. That enthusiastic statement was made by the Micronesian supervisor of the pepper project. He can be justly proud, because since 1964, when the Trust Territory Agriculture Division began the project, it has been a total success. Similar to rice, the most exhausting work in establishing a pepper garden comes in the beginning, with field clearing and preparation and the cutting and transporting of fern locks which are necessary to hold fast the pepper vines. tall, old, live fern trees, which only grow in the mountains, are cut and shoulder carried down to the field site.
Since everything is done by hand, teamwork and cooperation from the neighbors speed the project along. Once the front posts are in place and the soil is well composted, the extension agent makes the cuttings from the mature vines. These cuttings are then placed in a shaded nursery and once they take root, they are field planted. The farmer carefully observes how it is done. All the pepper fields are periodically visited by the project supervisor. If the farmer has special problems, they are discussed. To date, Panabe pepper has been almost completely disease free. Infrequently, a lone vine root will require treatment. When the spikes which hold the fruit of the pepper are filled with firm, mature, yellowish-green berries. They are ready to harvest. Most mature spikes will contain one or more red berries. It is from these berries that we get white pepper, while the green berries are scalded to cause the green husks to turn dark brown or beautiful black. Ah! It certainly smells like the world's best. In some districts, again especially here in Ponape, the role of the traditional chiefs is almost undiminished. Our agriculture department established the Agriculture Advisory Council and invited all traditional leaders and elected chief magistrates to participate in giving directions to existing programs and to establish new and imaginative ones to help our farmers. The response was 100% favorable. The Advisory Council in turn initiated a fund drive to put another organization, PPCA, that's Bonaba Producers Cooperative Association, on its feet financially. PPCA a co-op owned by Ponopens serves as a clearing house for all agricultural produce. It's a sort of a farmer's market. It is located in Colonia, the district center, near the harbor, easily accessible to the members. Many of the Colonia residents are people from the outer islands who do not own land on Ponape. They are employed by the Trust Territory government or the local businesses and they rely on the farmers market for their fresh vegetables and local foods which are unavailable elsewhere. Therefore the role of the farmers market is twofold. It provides a service to the district center while encouraging the farmers initiative in expanding gardening operations to grow local foods such as taro, arrowroot, yam, sweet potato, cassava, breadfruit and banana, as well as many of the newly introduced varieties of cabbage, cucumber, beans, squash and tomato, and to grow them as cash crops. The increased agricultural activity is an economic plus because it reduces greatly our dependence on imported foodstuffs and at the same time promotes the maintenance of a balanced diet in the more urban communities.
Bonape and Micronesia is in the middle of a great change which is just gaining momentum. Great change that we hope will bring us into the 20th century. And even though many a visitor has likened our homes to paradise, we are looking for more than just subsistence in paradise. <laughs>